Hi friends, Veronica Wax is here. And today I decided to take a time and to answer numerous questions, but it, they all boil down into one. People are asking, why is that when I have acid reflex and I go again and again with the same complaints or different complaints about my acid reflex to primary care or to gastroenterologist, they always prescribe PPI, H2 blockers, or uh, something like better Nicole. The best they, they do is rec will recommend me surgery that I don't want to do. So why they will prescribe you PPI? By the end of this video, not only you understand why, you also will stop bothering them and demand something else from them. So in this video, we will cover five topics. Number one, medical school. Number two, standards of medical care. Number three, role of pharmaceutical companies treating your acid reflex. Number four, health insurance companies. And finally, number five is licensing board. So let's go. This is actually a question from a real subscriber. And that's what um, I'm going to answer. Why my doctor prescribes PPI? Number one. Medical school. We go to medical school. We learn all of this wonderful subjects: anatomy, physiology, embryology, pathology, cardiology, pulmonology, gastroenterology, differential diagnosis, uh, gynecology. Then we learn pharmacology, and then we learn how to prescribe drugs because pharmaceutical companies are heavily subsidizing medical school. Number two medical standards of care. So what that means is when you go to your primary care physician or gastroenterologist and you complain about your acid reflex, you give them a bunch of symptoms and they identify this is acid reflex. They go online, they fill out your chart online, and then they click the button called diagnosis and they put there acid reflex, and then they click next button that says treatment, and the scroll down menu will fall out. And they will see their possibilities of the treatment. And it will be either H2 blockers, PPIs, or betanicol, or gavascon, or surgery, recommendation for surgery, okay? That's all that they have there. So that's called a standard of treatment. If physician violates from the standards of treatment, there are uh, severe consequences. And I will talk for a second about them. Now, um, standards of treatment are basically recommendations that are created by medical association, such as American Medical Association, uh, Association of Gastroenterologists, Cardiologists, Oncologists, Pulmonologists. And they create a list of the treatment list for different health conditions. So they call it guidelines. So if you have an acid reflex, so that's the possibilities of the treatment. If you don't, don't follow the standards of treatment, you could be sued. You could be sued either by patient and patient definitely will, will, will win the suit if you did not follow the standards of treatment. You could be sued by American Medical Association or Gastroenterological Association. And if you sued, your malpractice, price of malpractice insurance will go up and people will pay exorbitant price. Um, I have an example here, 150,000. Some, some professionals pay that sum. It will go up and up and it basically will kill your practice. Pharmaceutical companies. They subsidize medical schools, they subsidize medical journals, they subsidize medical associations, they create the drugs, they research the drugs, and they publish the data, whatever they want, in the medical journals. If something does not suit them, so the data is not going to be published. So you understand that all the information comes to doctors are very tightly controlled. So pharmaceutical companies are participating in your treatment heavily. So you understand he who plays, who plays the piper calls the tunes. Okay, finally, health insurance. When doctor, you go to doctor, he fills the, your chart online now and um, 
you know, menu dropped and you have acid reflex diagnosis, with, which is ICD-10 code. And then he has a treatment and the treatment have to be standard. Otherwise, health insurance company is not going to pay for your treatment. Number five, medical license board. All, all physicians have a license and the license to treat or perform surgeries. It's renewed annually or biannually. It depends on the profession and, and on the state that license was issued. When you fill out or for renewal your license, you always will be asked questions. Are you following standards of treatment? Do you use in your practice any medications or supplements that you did not learn in medical school or outside of your scope of practice? Do you do any procedures that uh, you are not licensed or outside of medical standards? And if you answered yes, then your license will be reviewed by the license board. And if the violation is, is severe, if you don't prescribe the medication, okay, then your case will be sent to um, a license board and your license could be suspended or um, revoked and basically, that's the end of your medical practice. Now, I want to show you. So I, I say that it's cookbook of medicine. This is the book where the all standard treatment is spilled out. In this case, it's Washington Manual of Medical Treatment. So, and here I open this book in acid reflex. And I will read you the standards of the treatment. Number one the basics of lifestyle modification, including eating small meals. Refrain from eating two to three hours before lying down, elevating your head six inches, decrease fat intake, decrease intake chocolate, coffee, cola, and alcohol, smoking cication. Medications such as calcium channel blockers, sedative tranquilizers, sleep medication, and other such non-steroid anti-inflammatory drug have to be reviewed. So you are lucky if you go to your primary or gastroenterologist and you get a piece of paper where it says, elevate your, uh, elevate your head when you speak, don't eat before bedtime, eliminate coffee, chocolate, Coca-Cola, on all kinds of soft drink. You better do that because in 80% of the acid reflex, People will become, get, will get better actually if they will change the diet. So there are people who are not getting better from doing all of these changes. Then if they don't get better, you go back to your primary and you complain again. And then the next step in the cookbook is medical treatment. Number one, H2 blockers. Number two, PPI. Number three, prokinetics such as betanicol. Number four is surgery. That's it, guys. No physician is going to look into your food sensitivities, your irritable bowel syndrome, your constipation, whatever you may complain, that's going to be a separate issue. It's going to be for the next appointment. So you cannot demand from your gastroenterologist something else. Now, I want to say a few words. We are physicians, we are complicit in that. We understand very well if patient is healthy or person is healthy, he's not going to come for medical appointment, no money made. If person is died, so you cannot make money also on uh, that person. So there is a the sweet spot where the patient is not healthy and come for the appointments again and again. It's either could be complaints or renew the prescription or uh, they get new medication, okay? All of this interval before person died is where you actually are making money, okay? So if you are the person who actually want to get better, you have to take responsibilities for your health. Don't put these responsibilities on your primary, on your gastroenterologist, on me, on your spouse, on your children you are the one is responsible. And I have a, a, had a client, we were laughing about that. He said, I heard you 
as a consultant, I paid you. And guess what? I have to do the job. I said, you're absolutely right. You are going to do the job. You have a consultant. You are going to change the diet. You are going to experiment with supplements and give the feedback to your consultant. Am I getting better? I'm getting worse or whatever. You cannot expect that from your primary care physician. Okay, guys, thank you very much for your attention. Like, subscribe, ask me questions here. Bye-bye for now.